I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know who you say I am loved when I can't feel a thing And you say I am strong when I think I am weak And you say I am held when I am falling short And when I don't belong, oh you say I am yours What you say of me, I believe The only thing that matters now is everything you think of me In you I find my worth, in you I find my identity Oh, oh you say I am loved When I can't feel a thing And you say I am strong When I think I am weak And you say I am held when I am falling short And when I don't belong Oh, you say I am yours And I believe Oh, I believe What you say of me I believe Taking all I have and now I'm laying it at your feet You have every failure, God You have every victory Ooh, oh, And you say I am loved When I can't feel a thing and you, you say, say I am strong When I think I am weak And you say I am held When I am falling short And when I don't belong Oh, you say I am yours And I believe Oh, I believe what you say of me, I believe, yes I believe, oh I believe, what you say of me. John chapter 12 verses 37 to 50. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in the presence, they still would not believe him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe because as Isaiah said, says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts 
so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet at the same time, many among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. Then Jesus cried out, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. There is a judge who is there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words the very words i have spoken will condemn them at the last day for i did not speak on my own but the father who sent me commanded me to say all that i have spoken i know that his command leads to eternal life so whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. But if you believed it, who will listen, who will be saved? In his Father's eyes, a tender plant come to save us from the grave. In our eyes unattractive, Nothing made us want him at all This man of many sorrows Who oh, would save us from our fall He was oppressed and he was afflicted And yet he never said a word as when he laid in the manger And no crying there was heard Now as a lamb led to slaughter He stood silently again But who among those people knew He was dying for their sin Oh, we like sheep have gone astray We have turned everyone to his own way And we rejected And we despised him But there's one thing that you should know He loves you so He will reign again And God's kingdom will be established in his hands this man of many sorrows will give us his perfect plan. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and we rejected and we despised him. But there's one thing that you should know He loves you so It was the Lord's good plan to bruise him And to fill him with our grief His soul was made an offering And from sin we have relief Now in righteousness he lives, he reigns to the glory of heaven's praise This man of many sorrows God's faithfully has raised But if you believed it Who will listen, who will be saved By this man of many sorrows this man of many sorrows 
whose life for us he gave John chapter 13 verses 1 to 17 it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel round his waist. After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped round him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realise now what I am doing, but later, you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you for he knew who was going to betray him, and that, wa that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he'd finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. There's a saying in the Bible which is quite difficult. Um, it says this, Many are called, but few are chosen. When we think about that, it is almost like we feel that it should say, many are called, but few respond. But that's not what it says. It's awfully inconvenient to our ideas about God that it says, many are called, but few are chosen. And this passage that we have today um, in front of us, which is the one that was read at the beginning of the service by Ninoshka, um, continues on this theme. It says that God said through Isaiah, he, and speaking of people who don't come to believe him, it says, God has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts, nor turn. And again, this is very hard. When I was at Bible college, um, I had a lecturer who had started to believe that when Judgment Day came, when the end of the world came, God would save everyone regardless of their relationship to him during their lives through Jesus Christ it was almost 
that God would say, oh, well, I put this in front of you to give you a challenge. But now we have come to judgment. It's all right. Everybody goes to heaven. And it's an interesting viewpoint. It is becomes more difficult when you look at what the Bible has to say. It also um, becomes more difficult when you look about the idea in practice. Because if you say everybody goes to heaven, then that means that Adolf Hitler would go to heaven. It would mean that um, the tyrants who have let who have been in charge of communist nations would um, go to heaven. The evil and the wicked would go to heaven. And heaven would become rather like this world. It wouldn't be any different at all. And so God would have to do it all over again. And also that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross at Calvary would be reduced to a mere show of love and nothing more than that. And I don't want to underrate love when I say that. But Jesus died upon the cross in order that our sins might be forgiven and that we might have peace with God. And if it was any less than that, then it becomes a very strange thing indeed. But it remains that sometimes when we read the Bible and we say, I don't like that idea in the Bible, so I won't believe that idea because it is uncomfortable. We end up in a situation where, in effect, if God inspired the people whose voices are recalled, recorded in the Bible, we end up saying, well, I know God better than God does. I know God better than Jesus did. I know God better than Isaiah did. Bearing in mind that we are filming this sermon, if anyone should edit that bit of the sermon down in order to present me saying, uh, I know God better than Jesus did, I shall never forgive you. Obviously I will because that's the requirement of a Christian, but you take my point. And so, when the Bible says that some people were prevented from coming to God because God did not enable them to turn to God, it is uncomfortable and it is hard, but it is what God says. It is very difficult, but it would appear to be true. And there are some things about God that we can understand fully, and there are some things about God that we can never understand in this world because we are less than God ourselves. And if we could fully understand all of those things, then we should be the ones who 
would be surprised by our own knowledge. But this passage that Ninoshka read for us, it follows on from one a little while before where some Greek people came to inquire if they could speak to Jesus. And in this passage, it particularly mentions that the Jewish people didn't want to believe in Jesus. And some people sometimes say to me, well, Darren, why don't more people believe in God? Why don't more Jewish people believe in God? And the answer is, I don't know. Other than the fact that that during this era, is God's plan. There was a time earlier in history when most of those who believed in Jesus were Jewish. At the moment, most of those who believe in Jesus are not Jewish. And I have no answer for that. This is... God's plan. It's not my plan. It's not necessarily the way that I would like it to be. But it is God's plan. Because when we believe in Jesus, the Bible seems to be saying it is not entirely our choice that God is at work in our lives to help us to believe. And if you object to that idea, then you prove God wrong. You go ahead and believe in Jesus without his help. I suspect later when you reflect on it, you would decide that you had his help anyway. It says in this passage that many of the Jewish leaders came to believe in Jesus because of his teaching. Not despite his teaching, even though his teaching was hard. But they wouldn't say it publicly for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. And sometimes this is one of the reasons that we don't do what God wants us to do. It is about human pride. Because all of us, whoever we are, like to look good in the eyes of others. We don't want to look like the person in our group or social standing or street or whatever who is regarded as being least important. But what Jesus says here is that whatever he says, the Father in heaven says. And if we respond to it, we are not only responding to Jesus, we are responding to the Father and we are responding to the Holy Spirit. And even that proves that God is the one who takes the lead in these things. Because we cannot respond to Jesus' teaching unless we first hear Jesus' teaching. It would make no sense at all to say, I believe in Jesus, if you did not know what 
you were believing in. But again, here we come to a, another difficult thing. That there is one God in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And because we are, as individuals, singular people, we find the whole idea that a being could be more complicated and more complex than us, different than us, difficult. Of course it's difficult. It is, if it was easy, again, God would not be God because he would not be greater than us. And if he was not the one who chose who is to be saved, then he would not be almighty God. There would be things that would be out of his control. Jesus says in verse 50 of chapter 12, I know that his command leads to eternal life. He's speaking of God here. And so, the thing that Jesus says is the thing that leads to eternal life. But there must be a response on our part. And with God's help, we can choose to believe but again without God's help we cannot choose to believe I didn't say it wasn't going to be complicated and the passage that Isabel read for us a little later in the service from um, John chapter 13 and the first 17 verses there about Jesus washing his disciples' feet is an important part of this. You know, if you are a person who has been in love, you know, you may love a best friend you may love someone who you are married to you may love a boyfriend or a girlfriend you may love your pet dog or your pet cat there's all kinds of things that you can love um, you know, sometimes people make a distinction between loving and being in love. I think that's usually a nonsense. It's usually the thing that people say when they are wanting to find a reason for leaving someone that they have previously been with. You know, well, I love you, but I'm no longer in love with you. Which often means um, I'm not 18 anymore. I'm now 35. And emotions develop. But when we love somebody... It is usually because there is some form of loveliness about them. 
there is something that we find compelling and attractive. And this may not be, although it could be, it could be something to do with appearance, but I want to say it's mostly about character. Sometimes in the movies, if you go see a film, you see somebody who has fallen in love with somebody, even d despite the fact that the person they're in love with is really horrible. They treat them like dirt, but they still love them, and there's nothing they can do about it. I don't get that, to be honest. Um, maybe some psychologist or psychiatrist can explain that way more than I can. But when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and we're going to talk more about that next week, he was showing something of the loveliness of God. The reason why we would love God. Because God is kind, and God is caring, and God does beautiful things for us. And even though you might be reluctant to admit it, even if your husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, pet dog does things that are loving and kind and caring, God does things that are more loving and kind and caring. Because that, those characteristics in your boyfriend, husband, wife, girlfriend, pet dog, come from God. Because as the Bible says, God is love. And so God displays these characteristics and just seeing them draws us towards him. When you read the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet, if you think, what a stupid thing to do. You haven't understood it. Or in terms of your character, you're in the wrong place. And that shows that you're not ready yet to understand and love God. You know, when Serena was a baby, sometimes I used to creep into her room at night. And first of all, I would be worried that perhaps she wasn't sleeping. But then once I'd found out she was sleeping, I would be worried that she wasn't breathing. And I would feel a sense of panic in myself because this person that I loved who was so small and so helpless in her cot might have died. Because you hear about those things in the newspapers. You hear about cot death and things like that. And I was so scared because I loved her so much. So it's not just about boyfriends and girlfriends and husbands and wives and pet dogs and pet cats and best friends. It is about our children. And we are God's children. And he loves us so much 
that he sent his only son into the world to die for us. I read a book that a preacher wrote some years ago that caused some big controversy in which he said that God sending Jesus into the world to die for us was an immense act of cruelty on God's part. But oh, what a misunderstanding of God's purpose. God loves us, and therefore he comes in the world to serve those he loves. That God, who we think of as being needed to serve, needs to become our servant in order to save us is just amazing and wonderful. So the great thing here is to do with love. Love beyond our comprehension. Love that draws us towards God. Love that wraps us in its arms that is even above the greatest and most wonderful human love we've ever experienced. We must surrender to the love of God because he loves us. Amen.